Hello friends, welcome back. This week, it's Harley Davidson, the amazing American motorcycle brand and fashion brand. And we're gonna take a look, point one, at what makes a brand into a cult brand with such a following. Harley Davidson is one of the few cult brands in the world, and we're gonna take a look at that. The other thing I like to look at this week, point two, is feed the customer. Harley Davidson, through their ups and downs, did a great job of feeding the customer what they wanted. Let's first take a tour of the origins and growth of Harley Davidson and look at what happened and how it built the motorcycles and became the cult brand it is today. I won't spend a lot of time on the history, but there's some very interesting tidbits that shows you the roots of the company and how they were built. In 1901, a young man named William Harley, who is you know, like any young man, thinking about things in the future and what would be interesting, he makes a little sketch of a motorcycle. Well, it was a bicycle with an engine and you didn't have to pedal it, which would become what we now know as the motorcycle. And in 1901, he's sketching that and envisioning where he's gonna go with it. And in 1903, about a year and a half later it was, his friend Arthur Davidson joined him and they built the Harley Davidson Motor Company in Milwaukee, Wisconsin. And they had a little wooden shed, 10 foot by 15 foot, and that's where they built their first motorcycles. Incidentally, in 2014, one of those early motorcycles, and there's dispute of whether it was the second serial number, the third serial number, but one of those real early 1903 circa Harley Davidson motorcycles sold for 15 million dollars at a collector's auction. So if you have an old Harley sitting in your garage somewhere, you may want to check it out because if it's a really old one that your great grandfather had, uh, you might not have to work anymore. So go dust that thing off and take it to an auction. So they go moving along and what's also very interesting, in June of 1903, and this would come full circle a hundred years later, Ford Motor Company was born in Dearborn, Michigan. So you have two unique American transportation brands, Ford and Harley, literally built, born roughly the same time. It just shows you the advancement that was uh, coming in America at that time with you know entrepreneurship. So in 1904, the you know following the birth of the motorcycle came the and the birth of the car came the first dealer. And a dealer in Milwaukee, Wisconsin sold some of the first production bikes. The ones that they make over and over and over again were selling to the public, not just the first few. In 1904, the first one is sold in Chicago, Illinois to the public by C.H. Lang, who's a legend in Harley Davidson history. Well, they progressed pretty quickly. And in 1909, the first V-twin was seen. And now you look at Harleys everywhere and you can see that V-twin that dates all the way back to 1909. They're far more advanced nowadays, of course, but at that time, the iconic shape of the engine and all those cooling fins that we see and we think, oh, that's a Harley engine, it was started in 1909. 1910, they trademarked the familiar logo. This is actually not something that a modern branding expert did. Harley made that and they made that back in 1910, and they trademarked it. It's been dressed up a little bit, but it really hasn't changed months since that time. Uh, and by the way, in 1914, the first motorcycle helmet was introduced, not by Harley Davidson, but by a doctor who was watching motorcycle races and seeing people crash and get really hurt, and he came up with a way to take a little canvas and shellac and make little more than an eggshell that you would wear. But Nonetheless, another entrepreneur sees the result of motorcycles racing around and the helmet is born. In 1917, the world's in World War I and one third of all Harley Davidson's made were sold to the military as an efficient way to, to get couriers and people around. And it's not the last time guys with guns would be seen on motorcycles. 1920, Harley is officially the largest motorcycle company in the world. Copycats were emerging, but Harley was number one in the biggest. And by the way, at that time, they had 2,000 dealers in 67 countries. They were just 1903, so this is 17 years later. It's global at a time where you know shipping was done by boat. So it's a pretty amazing feat. Uh, also that year, the hog entered the picture. Now, if you know anything about Harleys, you know that they're called hogs. All the time they call them a hog. And where it came from was this uh, famous Harley racer would win a race and then pick up this baby pig and take a baby pig on a victory lap. 
a baby pig. And so it became known as the little hog, and so Harleys became known as hogs. So that's where that little nickname uh, came from. And I'll tell you a little uh, bit later uh, what people think it came from, but it's not. It started with that little pig on victory laps after one of the early Harley enthusiasts, an accomplished racer, would win. There you go. It's crazy, isn't it? Well, in 1928, the uh, twin cam came out, and you know, as they continued to grow and be successful and be this just an amazing company, and what's interesting about 1928, I bring that up because that twin cam, that twin cam Harley 1928, had a top speed of a little over 100 miles an hour. That was the max out absolute flat top speed of 100 miles an hour. This is 1928. You're on a motorcycle doing 100 miles an hour. Friends, roads weren't paved in America the way they are now, and you're on a motorcycle in those early American roads doing 100 miles an hour. There's only one word for that, and that is damn! That's fast! By the way, that year, the Indianapolis 500, the fastest car in the race was 122 miles an hour on a, on a racetrack. So it just shows you that the, the motorcycle and everything that Harley was about, and they were all about racing, and they were all about freedom and enthusiasm, but it was all coming together. Um, and they would continue to grow, and in 1941, we had World War II, and all the civilian bike production stopped, as again, they were building motorcycles for the U.S. military that was used for couriers and other service patrols and everything because it was a very effective means of transportation. Now in 1947, a very you know World War II is almost is you know rolling out, and the first motorcycle jacket is sold. So the first Harley apparel. We move into 1954 when they had a little bit of a hiccup. They were charged with restrictive business practices, and they started to see a hiccup in their growth. And it was because they really missed a step. And what they did was, uh, there were cheaper uh, motorcycles coming from other parts of the world, and they didn't like that. They didn't like the fact that there were, you know, Japanese motorcycles coming ashore, and they tried to restrict it by saying, hey, put a big tariff on them. Uh, and, and that really wasn't the way to do it, because freedom and uh, free enterprise around the world, um, regardless of how you feel that certain governments do and don't conduct business, Harley, in my opinion, made a mistake. And a lot of people thought they made a mistake. And they wanted this tariff and they were told, no, that's not gonna happen. So it was blocked, they continued to grow, but they kind of stumbled. And 14 years later, in 1969, believe it or not, this wonderful, incredible company was nearly bankrupt. And then AMF, which stands for American Machine and Foundry, which was a uh, a sports and enthusiasm kind of brand in America. They built a lot of things. Um, they bought Harley Davidson and they started trying to cut a profit on it, but without a focus on the product. And they, they trimmed people out, they reduced size. And before you know it, not only were they a struggling company, but the quality and the performance of the bikes sagged and the once proud brand became Tarnish, and believe it or not, in the early 70s, Harley Davidson's little nickname among people was not very friendly, and it was hardly drivable. It wasn't Harley Davidson, it was hardly drivable. You bought a Harley? Why would you do that? It's hardly drivable. Why don't you buy a Honda? Honda motorcycles were known as cheap, lightweight, efficient, and they didn't break. So suddenly this competition and the purchase by AMF leads to this terrible chapter in the company's life. Well, within the company were men that had a beating heart for the origin of Harley. They really wanted to see it come back. And 13 senior executives in 1981, along with Willie Davidson, who's a descendant of the original uh, founder, they got together and went to AMF and they bought the company back from AMF in 1981. And they had this, this war cry. They said, the eagle soars alone. You can see in some of the uh, Harley-Davidson logos, you'll see these eagle's wings. Well, 
they were all about the eagle soars alone and we are making a comeback. So here comes Harley making a comeback. Now if you really want to read the long, long story of Harley, there are many books that have been written and they take you through all of the finer points and I've skipped a bunch of them because what's really important is we get to the point where men with a passion for the brand wanted to see it recover and soar to new heights. Well, they started by thinking about the customer. And in 1983, they formed HOG, which stands for the Harley Owners Group. And they took that from that original nickname for the bike, the HOG, that dated back to the guy that won races and would take a pig on a victory lamp. And they said, and now we need to get back to what our brand stood for. When we were originally born, we were winning races, we were building great bikes, we were an innovator in motorcycles. People loved to be on a, uh, on a Harley because it was the first one and it was iconic and we had the first V-twin engine and all these advancements. And then we lost our way in the 50s and 60s and almost went bankrupt. We gotta come back and think about all those things that made us great. Well. The 80s and 90s saw them stumble here and there, but they got, they got it back on track. And as a matter of 1986, they took it on the stock market. So they came back there. And there's a very interesting thing. In 1987, right after they go on the stock market, the average income of a Harley Davidson rider was $38,000. Now let's take a look at this. 10 years later, the income had more than doubled to $83,000 in 1997. Now sure, there's inflation and the dollar would rise and stuff, but the point was Harleys were being bought by more upscale people. Now if you think about 1996, someone that was born in the early 60s is now 35, and they're kind of returning to their roots and buying these Harleys that were bigger and had the familiar sound and had all this style associated with them, uh, and that was, really something that you look at and see the genius of the guys that brought the brand back at the same time they brought the bikes back. Better bikes, better quality, feed the owners group, focus on the things that, that matter to them and let the brand soar. Well, in 2003, something interesting happened. Ford Motor Company, remember Ford talking about? So it's the 100th year anniversary. In 2003, they celebrated the 100th year anniversary with a special edition of the Ford F-150 pickup branded Harley-Davidson. Now check this out. Four years earlier in 1999, the whole world in the automotive community was like, what? What's going on? Because Harley and Ford announced that there would be the Ford F-150 debut in 1999 of the Harley-Davidson version of the Ford F-150. It was black, it had chrome, it had the letters Harley-Davidson sitting on the back bed of the pickup. It had the Harley, you know, the eagle icon, the brand silhouette on hubcaps. And everybody in the automotive world is saying, wait a minute, to sell more pickup trucks, you're branding it for a motorcycle brand? And Ford was like, we want the Harley owners to come to Ford and we want to show them a version of the truck so that when they're hauling things around, because a Harley is a pleasure vehicle, obviously, it's not a full-time, seven-day-a-week commuter vehicle. But we want to get to the essence of the Harley brand and bring that over to the F-150 to tip our hat and to show our love to those owners. And guess what? It worked. They sold a ton of these. And in 2003, there was a special marketing campaign between Ford and Harley turning 100 together. So a couple, you know, iconic brands in America getting together, but with the most iconic of them all, Harley Davidson and the symbol of freedom and power and expression in the motorcycle. And when you say iconic, it means like it is the brand everybody looks to. It's the symbol everybody looks to and everything about what it is it defines it. Like people say, that guy's the Babe Ruth of tennis because Babe Ruth was the iconic example of the guy that dominated everybody. He's the Babe Ruth of football. Well, Harley Davidson, there is no other. There is only one Harley Davidson of motorcycles and it is the iconic brand that is Harley. So interesting thing, they're focusing on all this branding and accessories and in 2005, Harley Davidson accessories, dressing up your bike and apparel crossed a quarter of a billion dollars. Now not all of that quarter billion was apparel, but it shows you that in addition to selling motorcycles, a quarter of billion dollars was on these accessories and apparel and branding. 
and we saw Harley-Davidson cafes crop up. There's an amazing Harley-Davidson restaurant in Las Vegas that you can go to. And it's similar to Hard Rock Cafe in which it celebrates everything that is Harley, but it's a restaurant and it's the Harley brand. So the Harley brand by the mid 2000 had made a full recovery and it had achieved cult status to the point that in 2006, the management made a simple decision. They called Wall Street and they said, you know Harley-Davidson Incorporated, HDI, our stock ticker? Yeah, change it. We want it to be hog, because we're all about the owner. And so the final step is the stock ticker for Harley-Davidson is now hog, dating back to that pig on a victory lap and more importantly, the Harley Owners Group and all about the brand, which those men that took that company back from AMF instilled. So they were the cult brand and even had a cult stock ticker. Now let's talk a little bit about cult brands. What makes a cult brand? You don't start out to say, I will be a cult brand tomorrow. It takes time to build that. But let's look at what goes in it. And there's about seven principles that a lot of places, um, there's a great website out called Cult Branding that talks about these very, a lot of these same principles and what makes a cult brand. And the first one I wanna get to is a cult brand, first and foremost, is different because people wanna be different. You don't buy certain fashion brands or Air Jordans because you wanna be the same. You buy them because you wanna be different and you think it represents you, whether it's an athlete and just do it like Nike or it's like Harley power, freedom, individualness, expression. So the first thing is cult brands are different. There's a real difference is at their essence. The second is there's usually courage and it's courage that is seen in the founder or the individuals that built the brand. And certainly you could see Harley and Davidson were building racing motorcycle at a time when many of the roads weren't hardly paved. And so you saw courage and, and newness that was in the founders that comes all the way through the motorcycle and its brand today. Lastly, fun and expression. I think that's simple. Harley Davidson's, it looks like fun. How many times you look at a movie and you see a Harley Davidson, you see him running down the highway and you say, man, that looks like fun. I don't even ride a motorcycle. Then there's listening. You know, they listen and they enable evangelists. They listen to the crowd. They listen to the cheers of the people that love their brand. And you know what they do with that? They feed it, but they listen and they allow evangelists to be born. Now, Harley Davidson has had some negatives with evangelists as when Hell's Angels are associated with Harley Davidson. But nowadays, you, the icons and the people that are riding Harley Davidson's come from you know, it's, it's more of a, it's a rock and roll image, but they listen and they allow evangelists to be created. Then it's tribal. It creates true communities. I'm a big fan of the Oakland Raiders. And when I see people on the street, like a Raider hat or Raider shirt, I'll look at them and I'll go, Raider Nation, baby. And you know what they'll say right back to me? They go, Raider Nation, right on. And so that is because I'm part of the cult brand that is the Oakland Raiders. I like my Raiders and I run into people and I simply Raider Nation baby. Similar with Harley Davidson. That's one of the points of a cult brand is the tribal nature. You see somebody, you salute them and they salute back. It's a tribe where everybody is part of it and they know what it means even if they've just met each other on the street and they're just giving thumbs up back and forth. The last is inclusiveness, openness. The openness is, it's inclusive. Hey, if you hop on a Harley or you're, you hop into the gear, we will welcome you to it. You have to be authentic and yet can't be silly, but openness and bringing an invitation to others to join the tribe is also essence of cult branding. And lastly, freedom. Cult brands invariably are all about freedom. The freedom to express, the freedom to do it. And more importantly, within freedom is cult brands draw power from their enemies. You can take my Harley, but you can't take my freedom! Enemies cause everyone in the tribe, the evangelists, those who are, are expressing to 
to band together and defend the brand. When you think about Harley and you think about people that criticize loud motorcycles, you'll see Harley owners come back together and go, whoa, what are you talking about? What are you talking about? They're not any louder or less loud than a lot of other things and other sports cars and things like this. You knock that off. You know, they, they come together and they defend the brand and they draw power from their enemies and detractors because when there's criticism, it's basically you're saying that you're different. When you get criticism of the people that are saluting or part of a brand or adopting that brand, guess what? You're now saying you're different. And that's exactly what part of being in the community is about. So the, the haters validate the difference and bond together the people and the cult brand and defending it all comes together. And I think when you take a look at like these criteria, Harley Davidson hits every single one of them. How are they doing? They're doing great. They've had their ups and downs, but today they're over $6 billion in annual sales. From 1980, a little after you know, 1990s, mid 90s, they hit a billion dollars. They had a little hiccup in 2009, but their history has been known for hiccups, but they've always recovered. So the stock market might not have liked it too much and criticized them, but the owners that were enjoying the new, reliable, advanced versions of the legendary Harley Davidson motorcycle expressed in the technology of motorcycles today with the branding that dates all the way back, those people are not bothered by a stock hiccup. That's not what it's all about. It is all about being part of the brand that is Harley Davidson. So here's to hoping that your brand or what your association with someday becomes a cult brand because it is an unbreakable bond between you and your customer. The two points this week, what makes a brand into a cult brand? And we talked about the points that does it. Because Harley Davidson, let me tell you, they don't sell motorcycles. Harley Davidson sells admission into the badass club. Whether you're wearing Harley gear or you're on a Harley bike, everybody that's in it, you're part of that club, part of that, that nation that is Harley Davidson. And the second, feed the customer. When those men rebought the company, they fed the customer better quality bikes, more advanced technology on the bikes, and more importantly, they created the Harley Owners Group that said, it's all about you, and I'm gonna feed it to you, and I'm gonna give you more of what you love in Harley. Do we have a black pillow? Do we have like a black, you know what? We need, we need a black pillow with chrome is what we need for this week. But anyway, please subscribe to Valuetainment. This is the best channel on the internet for entrepreneurs and all of the topics that help you take your company to the next level in your life as an entrepreneur. Until next time, I'm Tom Ellsworth and I hope I left you better than I found you.